Now, let's look at the Bible's testimony to soli deo gloria. Let's start with Ephesians chapter 2. And listen to these words, beginning at verse 5. We were dead in our transgressions. God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that, verse 7, here's a great doxological purpose so that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that, verse 9, here's this doxological purpose again, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. How does God save us? God saves us in such a way so that we look away from ourselves and to Him. He gets the glory and faith so that as we walk the Christian life, we walk in the things He prepared in advance for us to walk in, the good works He created. Our eyes go to Him in living out the Christian life and our eyes go to Him in the terminus. Why does God save sinners? So that He can manifest, He can demonstrate the riches of His kindness. We are actually objects of His love which magnify not us, but the greatness of His love. If you've ever thought, oh, I'm so important, look at the sacrifice that God made to get me. You've misunderstood the cross. You've misunderstood yourself and you've misunderstood the purpose of God. Rather, we ought to say, I was so awful that the only thing that could accomplish my redemption was the infinite cost of Jesus' death in my place. And that is how God puts on display His kindness to the undeserving. Not His rescue of the worthy. All glory goes to God in the way that He saves. Turn to Romans chapter 11. Romans eleven thirty three to 36 is a song in a letter. That is, it's just this outburst of praise in the middle of Paul's letter to a church at Rome. He, he wrote to explain the gospel in its full. And from Romans 1 to Romans 11, you have the great explication of how God saves sinners. And it culminates in this peon of praise, this just outburst in the middle of the letter. Paul says, oh, and th that is an, an emotion-laden oh. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments. How unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who became His counselor? Who was first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. Soli Deo Gloria. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Look at Colossians chapter 1. And verse 16. Paul writes, by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Now who's the him in Colossians 1.16? It is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn or the preeminent one over all creation. So we get that from Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. In Romans 11. And then we get from Jesus, to Jesus, and for Jesus are all things in Colossians 1.16. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 2. And verse 10. 
speaking of Jesus again, it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. And turn to Psalm 115. And listen to this refrain. This is a song that ought to be on our lips. Not to us, O Yahweh, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness. That's the Old Testament word for grace. Because of your truth. Look at Isaiah 43. In this monumental section, really covering nine chapters, Isaiah 40 to 48, God puts forth the charge, the challenge to his people, go ahead and try to compare me to anything or anyone. Put me up against the gods of the nations. Put me up against the idols of your hearts. Put me up against anything big and scary. Put me against anything beautiful. And nothing surpasses the glory of God. Nothing surpasses the character of God. Look at Isaiah 43, 7. Isaiah calls, everyone who is called by by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. This goes back to why does God make? Why does God create? Why did God in this instance uh, create a nation called Israel, redeem them out of Egyptian slavery and preserve them through their history? Why was God doing all of this? for his own glory. This is why the psalmist cries out, not to us, O Lord, uh, but to you be all the glory. Flip over to Isaiah 48 and verse 11. For my own sake, for my own sake I will act, says the Lord. For how can my name be profaned? And my glory I will not give to another. Here we see the reason God acts is for his own fame, for his own glory. And he is jealous for it. He will not share it. He he will not give credit to others where credit is not due. This is something God is actually jealous for flowing out of his good character. Sometimes we think of jealousy as something bad, sinful. And it often is with us. But a husband jealous for his wife's affections is appropriate. God jealous for his own glory is appropriate. It belongs solely to him. This sentiment is represented in the, in the prayers of the prophets when they ask for God's mercy upon sinful Israel. Remember Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9. Don't forgive us for our sakes. Forgive us for your sake, for your own namesake, for your glory and for your character in keeping with your promises. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 9. Here is wisdom in verse 23. Thus says Yahweh, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might, let not a rich man boast of his riches, But let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am Yahweh who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things, declares Yahweh. What could we possibly boast in? When you think about who we are, when you think about what we've done and what we deserve, we bring to the table nothing valuable. Uh, The best things we offer, Isaiah says, are as filthy garments. And so to come to Christ, to come to salvation, is fundamentally a boast in the Lord alone. Glory to Him. I have nothing. Turn to Romans chapter 2.
In Romans chapter 1, God indicted the irreligious, the Gentiles, the pagans, the outsiders as all sinful. And in chapter 2, Paul turns the tables to the religious, the insiders, the Jews, all sinful. And in case you missed the point of chapter 1 and chapter 2, Romans chapter 3 says everybody is sinful. There's no one righteous, not even one. But here in chapter 2, Paul zooms in on those who trust in themselves for a right standing before God. Look at verse 17. If you bear the name Jew and you rely upon the law and boast in God and you know his will, you approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, you're confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to, the, to those in darkness, a corrector of fools, a teacher of the infants, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You, therefore, who teach others, do you not teach yourselves? You preach against stealing, and yet you steal. You say people shouldn't commit adultery, but you commit adultery. You abhor idols and rob temples. And then notice verse 23. You who boast in the law through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? And that's the reality. A sinner, which is every human being who's ever lived except for the Lord Jesus Christ, is by definition a lawbreaker. How could anyone boast in the law having already broken it? James makes it clear if you break the law at any one point, you've broken the whole thing. You are by definition a lawbreaker. You have transgressed. And there is therefore no boast in any law keeping. This is why every human religion fails. Whether it's the five pillars of Islam, whether it's the meritorious good works and ceremonies of the Roman Catholic Church, whether it's the good deeds of the Mormons or any other system out there, you've got to accomplish something. You've got to do something. And the problem with that is you're doing something is further law-breaking on top of the law-breaking you've already done. And so anyone to, to boast in what they've done before a holy God only brings further indictment. Look at chapter 3 and verse 27. After describing the gospel itself that God made Jesus the perfect one, a propitiation, a satisfaction of divine wrath in his death on the cross that is acquired by the sinner only by faith. It is all of grace. That's Romans 3, 21 to 25. After saying that, he says in verse 27, where then is boasting? It would be a rhetorical question except Paul answers it. (laughs) He said it is excluded This is the great no-boasting clause of the gospel in the Bible. God saves sinners by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. And so there will be no boasting. No human accomplishment. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you have the gospel as foolishness in the eyes of the world. And, and, you know, the gospel was reprehensible, scandalous, puny, weak foolishness to a world that didn't understand it. That was true in Paul's day. It was seen that way at Corinth, and it's seen that way now. You understood that the Jews saw the gospel of a crucified Messiah as blasphemy. Anyone hung on a tree is cursed by God. He can't be Messiah. Besides, he didn't come and and establish us in the power that that we wanted to have and overthrow the Roman Empire. It's not him. The Greeks rejected a crucified Messiah because they thought it was the height of folly. It, It didn't lift up to the lofty views of wisdom and philosophy that they prized. And the Romans thought the cross of Christ was foolishness because it was just weak. It was puny. I mean, we took your king and we tortured him and stripped him naked and hung him up on a a beam of wood. He's nothing. And yet those who believed the gospel had experienced the wisdom of God and the power of God. And so they trusted in the cross, even while the whole rest of the world said, that's dumb, that's foolish, that's weak, that's powerless. And so Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, is reminding the the Corinthian believers, 
Look, you embraced the foolishness of the gospel. Why did God do it this way? Verse 29, so that no man may boast before God. Listen, you and I would never dream up the scheme of saving sinners that God planned from before time. We would never come up with the idea that the only way sinners get saved is that God himself take off his judge's robe, shows up as a victim, unrecognized, despised, impugned and maligned, spit upon and beaten, trumped up on false charges, executed. And that his suffering there would actually bear his own wrath against our sin that he'd be our substitute. We, we, we would never dream that up. We would come up with some scheme where we could add something to the mix. We would accomplish something. We, we give God a little bit. He meets us halfway. But we all just have this understanding. That is not God's plan at all. And God did it the way he did it, according to 1 Corinthians, to nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast. Listen, this soli deo gloria is bound up in the very way that God saved sinners. Look at verse 31. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the Bible's testimony to say oh, soli deo gloria. And it doesn't end there. It's, it's essentially on every page and the overt confessions of it come time and time again. The Westminster Confession, these are the, the, the great theologians, probably the best body of, of thinkers on biblical truth all in one place at the same time, kind of hammering out, what, so what do we believe? And they summarized man's purpose as this, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Why does man exist on the earth? They reflected the biblical truth. From him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. That includes your very existence. The reason you are, the reason you breathe, the reason God is sustaining you by the power of his word is for his own glory. And you need to know something about the Bible. Sometimes we think that the theme of the Bible is salvation. I would suggest to you the theme of the Bible is not salvation. That is a sub-theme. A theme over a whole book like the Bible has to encapsulate everything that's in it. And not everybody gets saved. The, the proper way to see the theme of the Bible is the glory of God as king. He is a sovereign king over all things and he is getting glory for himself by the way he is writing out all of cosmic history. And he will get glory for himself by saving some. And he will also get glory for himself by putting his own goodness on display through justice, through the punishment of sinners who do not believe the gospel. God will get glory from that. God will get glory for his inherent characteristics, even through judgment. Listen, friend, if you are on the wrong side of God, God will get glory from you. But while you are still breathing on this earth, this globe is still spinning, God still is sustaining your life, you're still breathing His air into your nostrils, and you are on borrowed time, listen, believe the gospel. Which means you have to abandon self-glory, you have to abandon self-merit, you have to abandon self-achievement, you have to abandon boasting in anything you could accomplish in order to embrace God's way of being saved. And when you do that, God will get glory from you, not by the execution of his justice against your sin. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, God will have already executed his justice against his son for your sin. And you will find only adoption and love and justification and redemption and forgiveness and eternal life. God will get glory from you through his love Unmerited favor, mercy, kindness, fatherhood. Let's talk about glory for just a moment. Glory in the Old Testament was the word kavod. It's the word heavy. It's the kind of word you ought to think about if you sit at the, at the foot of Niagara Falls and just hear the, the pounding of the, of the water on the rocks at the bottom of that cascade. 
It's the, it's the word a surfer thinks of on a, on a big day on the north shore of Hawaii and he stands at the cliff and he hears the cracking of a big swell against the rocks and he says, dude, that's heavy. Right? It's significant. We talk about people throwing their weight around. That's the Old Testament idea of glory. It's someone's weight or bigness or significance. In the New Testament, we have the, the word for glory is doxa. It's where we get our word doxology a study of glory. It is the word light. And so when we think about light, not lightness, the opposite of heaviness, but brilliant, radiating, shining light. That's the New Testament word for glory. And it is right to think of both of these concepts in the glory of God, the significance of His attributes, His character, His intrinsic nature, shine out in what the Bible calls unapproachable light. In fact, Jonathan Edwards summarized God's glory as the radiating brilliance of the sum total of God's attributes. That's a good way to think of it. It is all of who God is that just can't be contained and bursts forth. I agree with that guy. I should write that down. This is God's intrinsic glory. And it is not what we mean by soli deo gloria. To God alone be the glory. When we talk about soli deo gloria and, and to God be glory, we're talking there about ascribed glory. That's different than his intrinsic or inherent glory. God is just glorious. And if nothing were ever created, he would still and would always have been and will always be glorious. All in himself. But ascribed glory is when you and I recognize his intrinsic glory and reflect back to him adoration, praise, fame, love, delight in his intrinsic glory. You might be asking yourself, well, well, how can I glorify God? Am I adding something that he's missing? Well, no, not in, not in any inherent sense. What, what is missing if we don't glorify God is the appropriate response of his creatures and an audience and a, a voice for the fame due for who he is. But our glorifying God doesn't add anything to his essential qualities or his inherent brilliance. John Piper has used a helpful illustration on this that mirrors do not add anything to the lumen quality of a candle. But they do reflect that candle in such a way that it can be seen in other places where it wouldn't otherwise. For us to glorify God at the heart level and then with our lips through praise and through our lives as worship before Him is a declaration of His worth by the life of a creature. This is what the Reformation was getting at in Soli Deo Gloria, that, that salvation was only of God so that God would get all the glory for it. And the Christian life was to be lived out, Soli Deo Gloria, all for the glory of God. The Reformation's return to this critical biblical doctrine was in contrast to those things which had obscured God's glory by adding, by adding. And, and the things that were added to an attention to God alone were the things we've talked about already before, adding other revelatory authorities to the Scriptures, adding merits to grace, adding works to faith, adding other people and ceremonies to Christ. But it also had significant implications in terms of the Reformation for public worship. And I want to walk through a couple of these elements because when the gospel was recovered and the ground of the gospel, grace alone through faith alone and Christ alone was recovered, the end or terminus of the gospel was also recovered. Oh, all glory goes to God. Shouldn't that be reflected in the way Christians get together and worship God? This became critical. One of those um, was just the, the relationship of the congregant or the attender of a, of a mass 
to what was going on there related to God. In between the people and God was the altar and the priesthood and a Bible that could not be understood. I left my Latin text in my office, and I meant to bring it up here, and I meant to turn it to, I don't read Latin, I was just going to, in a really bad way, try to pronounce Romans 3, 21 to 25, turn my back to you and just sort of mumble through the Latin of Romans 3, 21 to 25, and then ask you if you were blessed by it, having not understood it, except for those kids in prep schools who study Latin and know more than I do. And the reality is, church on Sunday mornings would be vastly different if you were not hearing the preached word, the clear word of God, the the voice of Christ in his church from the pulpit. Uh, Preaching, unfortunately, by the time of the Reformation was innovative. The idea that the word of God would be studied and faithful, qualified shepherds would stand up and explain God's word to the people in their own language was foreign. In fact, the people who did that leading up to the Reformation were removed from the church, excommunicated, hunted down, oftentimes killed, and had to preach in the forests in the dark to anyone that would listen. And the Mass, of course, removed the the death of Christ from a, a clearly explained remembrance of what Jesus did at the cross to finish the work of salvation into this murky, mysterious, magical hocus pocus. By the way, we get our words hocus pocus from the Latin that was used over the Mass to turn the elements into the actual blood and body of Christ into this mysterious thing that nobody knew what was going on, but we just trust the system. That guy up there in those robes is doing that thing, and I guess that makes me right with God. If I stand up when he tells me to, sit down when he tells me to, mumble some repeated prayers. And so all the the truth, all the glorious truth of God that would bring God all the glory is hidden behind layer after layer after layer of human machinations. And so the truth was obscured and how is God going to get glory from those things? And and when the the gospel was sort of rediscovered publicly and then published, it began to change things. And and sometimes those changes came abruptly and violently. You had the iconoclasts, uh, uh, the class from the word to break and the breaking of icons were those who took sledgehammers to cathedrals smashed up statues and ground altars to bits, violent uprisings. And then you had others who tried to quell violence and and just say, no, let's try to reform this from the inside. You had others still who just left the church altogether and said, we're going to start our own thing. By the way, there are so many lessons from church history during the Reformation, um, but from people who loved the gospel and did things wrong, and from people who loved the gospel and did things right, and, and we have a lot of grace for those people because they did so in, in a murky theological environment under pure persecution with lots of hardship. Right? If, if we go to, to have a hypercritical spirit of everything that everybody did in church history, so far removed from their context, um, be careful the, the swords you wield. <laughs> uh, those will come back to you. We stand on the shoulders of the reformers with clarity that they gave to us. But it is good to go back and say, hmm, should we have done it this way or that way? There are lessons for us to learn. I think forward to maybe someday when uh, churches in the United States of America in the 21st century are not looked kindly upon. Maybe they don't get tax-exempt status anymore. And I think about the English nonconformist pastors who didn't want to do things the way the establishment said. We just want to preach God's word. And they said, great, you lose your building, you lose your home, which was attached to the church building, you lose your paycheck from the government to preach. All the financial things went away, and all the pastors were either in jail, or they compromised with the system, or they went destitute and stayed faithful. Maybe that happens. It'll be good for us to look back to this era and learn from our heroes. There was, during the Reformation, the priestly class that was the hoity-toity versus the hoi polloi commoners. In other words, there was this uh, distinction made between the clerical people 
Th- those are the really holy ones. They, uh, they become a nun or they become a priest or, or they become a deacon in the church. They have some official title. And then the, the normal sort of carnal people that just have to go about their fleshly lives uh, around the world. And, and, and then the great spiritual privilege was being part of the church. And, and then everybody else um, uh, just had to sort of go along with it. Sort of a two-class society, religiously speaking. Well, that went away in the Reformation. One of the, one of the herald statements of the Reformation was the priesthood of all believers, reflecting the New Testament principle that every single believer in Jesus Christ is not only a saint, but a priest in terms of direct access to God. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Everybody has ac- access. Everybody offers sacrifices, right? Your, your mind, your heart, your whole life up on the altar of God, a sacrificial service, Romans 12, 1 and 2. And so this distinction all of a sudden between the the privileged priestly class and normal Christians went away in the Reformation. The other thing that took a hit were the the relics. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Uh, And then the vestments. Uh, Those were the the robes uh, that the clerics wore. And, And different kinds of robes meant different things in different orders. But the idea was you had this outer garb that was a, a, a mark, outward mark of spirituality. Oh, that's a holy person. He's got those things on. And that went away, although it, became, it was a controversy for a couple hundred, couple hundred years in various denominations. But very early on in the Reformation, there were those who said, uh, those clothes have to go. Uh, Christians are, are normal Christians. They wear normal clothes. We don't need to dress up for an air of spirituality. And then the preaching became central. This was a fundamental shift in church life during the Reformation. If God is going to get glory all for himself, then his word must be the voice. No more Latin preaching. We're going to do preaching in the vernacular. That is, the preaching in the normal language. We're going to be preaching in order to be understood. And what is the point? The authority, then, is not the guy up front. The authority is the Word of God. Listen, one of the great compliments to a, to a preacher is, is when uh, someone compliments the preacher for something someone else preached. I just couldn't remember who said it. I, I think it was Omri. I think it was Josh. I think it was whoever. It, it's great when we get confused because the preacher is aiming at personal invisibility and the exaltation of the authority, clarity, and purpose of the Word of God. Christ is the shepherd of His church. And so preachers ought to be working hard to get out of the way. What's fascinating here is that with with the, the diminution of ceremony and priestly class and all the rest, you had at the same time the appropriate exaltation of the pulpit. And of course, if you go to Calvin's Geneva, we mean like a literal exaltation. There's like a spiral staircase and it sits way up there. I was thinking maybe we could put one on the back wall. I'm just kidding. But preaching became central in public worship. Listen, the the people were going to gather to hear God's word not get together for some perfunctory ceremony that the priest sort of does up there in secret. You don't know what's going on. You just go through the motions and then you leave. Preaching became central. The other thing that happened in the Reformation, which was foreign at the time, was congregational singing. And this relates directly to Soli Deo Gloria. If people hear the word of God and they understand it and that becomes central to worship and everything that's going on, And then the people have the opportunity to express responsively to God's grace in song. They get to sing to one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs. They get to sing truth to one another and to God. They get to express doxology to God as the audience with each other as the choir. Prior to the Reformation, there were choirs in the churches. The cathedrals of Europe were fantastic for, for singing. You have the, the chants and the songs, but, but they were performed. It wasn't congregational. What was the, the attender's job at church? Come in, hear them do their thing, watch that guy up there do his mystery thing, and, and then 
belief. But at the Reformation, truth was heard clearly in their own language. They believed the truth, and then they sung the truth together. Uh, Roland Baton, in his biography of Martin Luther, gives Martin Luther credit for the reintroduction in church history of congregational singing. And, of course, we sing Luther's hymn, we, the, the Mighty Fortress. It, it's still sung in our churches today, and appropriately so. And, and it was Martin Luther who reintroduced the idea that in church, all the Christians are going to sing. Now, we take it for granted. We, we come in and we, we do other things with singing. Sometimes we, we make singing the worship. Well, that's backwards. It, it's a part of our corporate worship. But it's helpful to remember that singing together as a body of believers on a Sunday gathering was new. Uh, not totally new. Of course, it, it was in Bible times God's people did that. Uh, but new in church history. There are implications for the lives of believers outside of church going during the Protestant Reformation. There was a recovery of doxology in marriage. A recovery of what it means for a husband to love his wife selflessly and sacrificially and for a wife to be devoted to her husband as a worship, as a matter of worship before the Lord and as a matter of gospel proclamation, right? It's the recovery of the doctrine of Ephesians 5 related to marriage. Why does marriage exist? It's a living parable of God's love for his people and his people's devotion to him. That was lost prior to the Reformation. The Catholic Church had made intimacy in marriage scandalous, wrong, dirty, bad. That was recovered. Actually, that area of life, like every area of life, was to be a matter of worship. In fact, the, the church had gotten this so backwards that they made their most spiritual people be celibate. What a terrible idea that is. It does nothing to corral the, the flesh, by the way. It just makes more problems. So an elevation of marriage to the level of worship was part of the soli deo gloria. And, and then the common everyday aspect of going to work and making widgets at the Reformation became a matter of worship. Now, we, we like John Calvin because we, we you know, read about Calvinism and, and we, maybe you read the Institutes of the Christian Faith. If you haven't read those and you call yourself a Calvinist, don't call yourself a Calvinist till you read them. It's an important principle. Make sure you know what you're agreeing with. But we like Calvin on the theological side. If you get outside of theological circles and you study John Calvin, he is a philosophical pillar of the Enlightenment. And he is considered the breakthrough philosopher in the area of, of the freedom of the common man. And by that, again, it was that uh, distinction between the priesthood and the laity, the, the priests in the church, the people who work for the organization, they're the spiritual people, everybody else is just common and fleshly. Calvin said, no, according to the scriptures, the guy who every day goes off to the factory and builds widgets is every bit the worshiper that the guy working for the church is. In fact, he may be more so. If he's making widgets for the glory of God, he actually goes to work and worships. And in Calvin's theology, in his worldview, was bound up this idea that the Christian recovers something out of the curse on work and turns it into this mixed condition. Yeah, work's still cursed, but a Christian worships when he goes to work. And worship isn't confined to the ceremonies that happen at the Mass. That was the liberation of the common man. In fact, Calvin's philosophy in that area eventually broke down the class systems of Europe. It took a few centuries. And the secular world views Calvin from that lens. And historically, it's accurate. But its grounding was theological, and its grounding was in this idea of glory to God alone. That the Christian has the ability to actually worship God on Monday morning at work. It was liberating. The Puritans went further, and they applied uh, the glory of God in their recreation. I don't know if you've had a sense of the Puritans as these sort of dour, pessimistic people that, that wore the most boring clothes in society. Um, you need to read about the Puritans because the opposites of every single one of those statements are the truth. 
In fact, if, if, if you were to apply Puritan doctrine to recreation, uh, you would follow their ethic, which was work hard, play hard, and, and do so for the glory of God. And, and like the reformers before them, they applied these things to, to marriage, to work, to recreation, uh, to friendships, to meals, to all of it. What is the church's need for soli deo gloria today? Well, um, wherever God's glory is robbed, we need a recovery. This happens at the individual level. When we love something more than we love Christ, when our affections are drawn to something that competes with Him, when Jesus is not having first place in my life, I need a return to this doctrine. It's very practical, right? This is not esoteric, academic. This is, I was built for worship. And when I yield my worship to lesser things, I am by definition an idolater. This also happens at the individual level when we think of God other than He is. When we reshape God after our own image, when we cut away the attributes of God that are disagreeable to us, we make God a false God. We want to bow down to something that's accessible, tangible, smaller than us, something we can control. We need to return to this doctrine. To God alone, the God of the Bible, and to Him alone be all glory. Collectively, the the, the church that calls itself evangelical must return to this doctrine, away from a man-centered theology. There's lots of ways you can be man-centered in your theology. Uh, the, 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 the practical ways that apply to churches is uh, churches become pragmatic. They ask the question, what does sinful man want to hear? Let's give it to them. How does sinful man want truth packaged? Let's package it that way. And they take away both the message of the gospel and the method of the gospel, which both rob God of his glory. God will have his message proclaimed clearly, unadorned, undecorated, in need of nothing that man could put on it to dress it up. Just faithfulness. That's what brings glory to God. A man-centered approach says, I've got to come up with some man-made mechanisms to address man's self-assessment of his problems and man's appetites for how he wants things packaged. (laughs) The church must return to soli deo gloria. Think about man-centered music in churches. I'll, I'll repeat the refrain. You've probably heard it often. I couldn't tell if that song we sang in church was to my girlfriend or to God. <laughs> Insipid theo- theology, shallow words, meaningless repetition, man-centered ideas, focus on self, I, 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 me, I, me, I. And those kinds of things go away. Uh, with a proper view of to God alone be the glory. I have a friend who's a faithful pastor um, in Russia, and he said, before 1989, um, we didn't have those silly songs you American Christians sing. (laughs) It's hard to sing those ditties under persecution. We just didn't do silly man-centered self stuff. We were on the run, and we were desperate. And maybe the church needs persecution to return to the glory of God. We need to return to the glory of God when we do not fear Him. If you haven't read Ed Welch's book, um, what's the title? Big and Small. When people are big and God is small, uh, put that in your top five. Um, the, the reality is when people have a small view of God, they tend to have very big problems. You have a great big biblical view of God, your problems will get smaller. No, we need to return to the doctrine of the glory of God alone. We need to return to this doctrine when we're tempted to build our own little empires, when we're tempted to get credit for things or boast in our accomplishments or long for the approval of men. Uh, That can happen in the industry. It can happen in the Christian life. 
You want to be seen by other Christians as doing Christian-y things. You want a pat on the back. You want credit for using the gifts that God gave you. Uh, you. You bemoan the fact that you don't have the opportunities that some other Christian has. All of that stuff is just man-centered and robs God's glory. God sees fit to equip and install his people in his church the way he sees fit according to his perfect plan. He's given you what you have. He has made you who you are. You use it relentlessly for his glory. You don't care what other people think about it. Anything else robs God of his glory. I'll close with words from James Boyce. He says, whenever in the church biblical authority has been lost, Christ has been displaced, the gospel has been distorted, or faith has been perverted, it has always been for one reason. Our interests have displaced God's, and we are doing his work in our way. The loss of God's centrality in the life of today's church is common and lamentable. It is this loss that allows us to transform worship into entertainment, gospel preaching into marketing, believing into technique, being good into feeling good about ourselves, and faithfulness into being successful. As a result, God, Christ, and the Bible have come to mean too little to us and rest too inconsequentially upon us. Let's pray together. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be all the praise. Would you help us in our longing to exclude boasting? And we pray that indeed you would receive all the glory now and forevermore. Amen.